Stand by to launch FanStream Sports. Three, two, one. Let's start. Hello, sports fans. Welcome to FanStream Sports. Nothing, nothing but pure sports. All right, it's the Jeff Fedoff Show. I am the aforementioned Jeff Fedoff. Follow me on Twitter at that happens. We are fan stream sports powered by DSP Media. Thank you so much for tuning in. Got a lot to get to today. A lot's been going on in the world of sports. Um, I want to start by talking about the uh, DeMar Hamlin injury in the Bills-Bengals game on Monday night. And uh, I'm sure you've seen the video by now, uh, but or heard about it by now. They, I don't think they show the video very You can probably find it out there, but it was troubling to see DeMar Hamlin uh, Monday night. Buffalo's at Cincinnati uh, midway through the first quarter. Bengals are up 7-3, um, and Hamlin makes a tackle and then stands up and then falls back down, collapses. His heart actually stopped on the field. They had to come out and revive him, and uh, after a long delay, then they had to get him stabilized, put him in an ambulance. They got his heart started again, but got him in an ambulance, took him to a local area hospital in Cincinnati, and there was a long delay before they decided what they were going to do about the game, and the NFL then eventually came out and said, that they are uh, canceling the game for now, postponing it for now. They're not sure if they're going to make it up or not. Um, and I, I, I'm, I don't want to get into the medical part of this. It's, it's a tragic situation, what's going on with DeMar Hamlin. He makes a full recovery. Um, there was a, uh, you know, the, the, the players on the field, obviously distraught. You saw tears flowing from both sides. Uh, a lot of compassion shown by both teams, uh, helping each other through this because it's something that, no football player, no athlete thinks they're going to see. It happens live on a field where a player's heart stopped. Uh, cardiac arrest episode on the field. And uh, I, it's interesting to see. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay the seriousness of it. But I want to talk about a couple of angles about what happened at, in the aftermath of this. And you know, like I said, he, he's there's no concrete reports, but apparently is showing some progress, getting better. Um, Not out of the woods yet at all, but uh, he's still in Cincinnati Hospital right now. Uh, DeMar Hamlin, the safety for the Buffalo Bills, 24 years old. The way that it was covered by ESPN, and it's not not something you could prepare for. Um, ESPN, I think, did a a very, um, I don't know if it's admirable, it's not the right word to use, but uh, they did a decent job of covering this and trying to maintain a, a sense of decorum, a sense of, you know, compassion for what was going on. But you could tell, I mean, this is not something they prepare for. And a long time ago, years ago, um, Howard Cosell, a famous broadcaster, originally on a, the Monday Night Football guy, he was the Monday Night Football telecast. He was one of the original um, members of the broadcast team of that. Also famously uh, befriended Cassius Clay and then Muhammad Ali when he changed his name. And one of the few, um, few broadcasters, to really uh, stand up for Muhammad Ali and what he was fighting for and stand with him, I should say. So when there were labor situations going on in the 70s with football and with baseball and later on in the early days with baseball, when there were all these different labor issues going on, Cosell always found it odd that you had sports reporters covering it because they aren't lawyers. They aren't ones who you know, necessarily could probably speak to what goes on in these labor negotiations, what is actually being fought for. So he, it, the gist of it was Howard Cosell thought that um, you should not have, you know, a baseball beat reporter covering a, a lawsuit to, for free agency within Major League Baseball. Basically saying, you know, they're not, they're not equipped to handle, they're not qualified to. You need someone with a legal background to do that, which is what Cosell had. He, he was very self-serving, by the way, the late Howard Cosell. And so... I was interested to see how ESPN and ABC, ESPN, ABC slash would, would cover this. And it, you could tell they were uncomfortable because of the situation, look, you've got, first of all, you've got sports reporters, sports announcers with like Joe Buck and Susie Colbert out there doing this. And then you've also got ex players, also Schefter out there, but ex players, um, you know, Booger McFarland, Troy Aikman, other people covering this as well. You've got a sideline reporter um, also doing this. So, it, and they're not medical people. And it's difficult, I think. It was, it was There were pauses, little awkward pauses in there because they weren't sure where to go. We didn't know what was going on with Hamlin. Um, we knew it was a serious situation at the time by the fact that how the players reacted, how quickly the medical staffs got out there and did something. So I think ESPN, all things considered, did a decent job. They're catching some flack because they were told 
um, that the players at one point were told you got five minutes to warm up. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I don't think ESPN, let me put it this way, I don't think ESPN misreported that. The NFL took their time in making a decision on what to do because this is something, now players, there's been a player died on the field. In the early 70s, a player died on the field near the end of a game. Um, I don't keep thinking of the Packers, but anyway, so, but that was a different time. That's 52 years ago, 50 years ago, whenever that happened. So things like this, don't happen. It's, and I, I'm okay with the NFL taking their time on this. There was talk about all oh, the NFL should have called the game right away. They should have, you know, announced it was big. No, I, I don't think they should. I think they did it the right way. I think they waited to see if there was an update. For instance, if they would have came out and said that Hamlin is fine, he's okay, no worries, then I think you could make a case that maybe we should go ahead and play, maybe we should get the game going again or maybe we should get the game going on Tuesday or whatever it was going to be. So I think they did the right thing in taking their time to make a, a decision like this. And uh, they ended up saying, we're not going to play it today. And then they come out and say, we're not going to play it this week. We're not sure what we're going to do. We might play it. We might not. It might be declared a no contest and we just go by winning percentage for the playoffs. Now in the grand scheme of things, that affects a lot of things because Bengals, Chiefs, Bills, all battling for that number one overall seed and a buy in the first round. Uh, if they declare no contest, the Bengals will win the AFC North over Baltimore by default. So there's a lot of moving parts in this on what they're going to do. And it's an interesting um, study to see how they handle this because do the Bills and Bengals want to play this game? Do other teams think this game should be played? I don't know if. And, and so, like, you know, the Ravens might be saying, yeah, play this game because it's going to affect us. Or they might say, you know what, it's one of our brothers. It's not that important. Let's not do it. So I do think that the NFL is going to take some time here, which they should. Wait and see what transpires, how the, the Bills are going back to practice now. Wait and see how the Bills players are, are doing with this. See how other players talk to player reps from around the other throughout league, the rest of the teams. See how they're handling and processing this and then come to a decision on what you should do, if you should even play this game or not. There's a few options out there. One is they don't play the game, and you just go by winning percentage in determining the seeding of the playoffs in the AFC. Another option is uh, playing it after this week and delaying the AFC playoff by a week. Um, that's, a, that's also a possibility as well. Let them play it to determine what's going to happen, and um, that's another option also. As of right now, they're going to play week 18 the way it is scheduled. They've got the schedule out with the uh, the, the Sunday night games, the Lions and Packers. They've scheduled everything, a couple of Saturday games, full slate of Sunday games, and then close Sunday night with Lions and Packers. So um, the medical staffs in this situation, by the way, were nothing short of amazing. And when you think about that, a player's heart stopped on the field and how quickly the medical staffs assembled to take care of him. And I didn't see all the inner workings. You couldn't tell from the camera angles what they were doing, but they were feverishly working on him, probably getting his uniform off of him to be able to try to revive him. And it was just, it. it so again, I, I, don't, I don't know the step-by-step -step how it happened or what, what it looked like, but the fact that they worked as hard as they did and as quickly as they did, mobilized as quickly as they could, determined what it was, worked together and get his heart started again is incredible. And the NFL should be, given kudos for that as well, for having those kind of systems in place to where they can mobilize that quickly and get out there on the field and do what they had to do to save this man's life. So, you know, that part also. Now, another, one of the things that also came out of this, uh, DeMar Hamlin has a, uh, a charity he, uh, that he founded, and I believe provides, provides toys for children, that kind of thing. But um, he, the foundation's been bombarded with donations since this happened. Uh, NFL players, um, all, all, you know, all owners, uh, player, they've made all kinds of donations to his charity. Now, it's, it's at last check, over $5.5 million has been donated to this charity, to this foundation uh, that DeMar Hamlin started. So um, I, I love it when they do things like this in a situation. I like it when a player gets hurt. I don't like a player gets hurt. I'm phrasing that wrong. When a player gets hurt, I like the fact that fans 
and players will sometimes make these huge donations to a foundation or charity in, uh, that the player has started up. So um, over $5.5 million now is in that charity. So we don't know yet what's going to happen with this Bill, uh, Bills-Bengals game, if they're going to play it or not. They might not. I don't know what the right answer is right now. I think the NFL's exploring all options. And uh, I, I don't have a problem with the NFL handled this on Monday night. I don't have a problem with the way ESPN covered it on Monday night. I think that ESPN did the absolute best job they could have done. And the NFL, I was fine with the patience. I know a lot of people said, you cancel right now. What are you waiting for? Why wait until an hour and a half after the injury happens or whatever it was? They were being patient to see what was going to transpire. All right. The uh, college football playoff championship game is now set. Georgia against TCU coming up on January 9th. We had such a treat on New Year's Eve with the games we got to see um, with the uh, the Michigan TCU game and then followed up by the Ohio State Georgia game. We're both just um, down to the wire type games. There was lots of scoring, but lots of excitement, comebacks, huge plays, uh, controversial plays as far as targeting calls and uh, was something a touchdown or not. But nonetheless, it is the among of the CFPs we've had so far, the combination, the semifinal games, it's the best slate we've ever had. On top of that, we had the USC two-lane game uh, that went on also, and um, that was in the Cotton Bowl, where Tulane scored 16 points in the last four minutes to beat USC, uh, Lincoln Riley, Heisman Trophy winner Caleb Williams, 42-41. to 41. It was, it was, it was a one-point game, nonetheless. Um, anyway, so that was an exciting game as well. We had a lot of exciting bowl games, intriguing bowl games. And so now this... Uh, we're, leading, we're getting ready for the 2024, the 12-team the playoff. And there's been people saying, oh, no, you see, we don't need a 12-team. Look how great. These are the four best teams. We got it right. You don't need to expand to 12. Other people are saying, wait, USC and Tulane, should they be in there? You know, should um, uh, should we have had Clemson in there? They got their butts kicked. Uh, but Tennessee, should we have Tennessee in there? The, there's other schools that say, wait, we, we should be in this conversation as well. Alabama obviously always feels like they should be in the conversation. I'm okay with going to 12. I don't want to see it get much bigger. This does not hurt the argument for 12. I think if anything, it helps the argument for 12. I still think we're going to end up with the four best teams most years. Where college football has been different in the playoff is usually the best team wins the championship. That doesn't happen in other sports. It doesn't happen in the World Series all the time or NFL, the Super Bowl, NBA playoffs. It happens more often than not. Uh, Not in the NHL, uh, not in March Madness for sure. So I'm excited about getting more games. What I would like to see change, though, and a tweak in the 12-team or when they go to it. Right now, the first four games, so it'll be seeds 5 through 12, 5 against 12, uh, 6, 11, 7, 10, 8, 9. Okay, those games are played on campus sites. And then the next wave of games, when you get to the quarterfinals, Those are played in bowl sites, on bowl game sites. I would much rather see that second round of games also be played on campus sites at the higher seeded team. That makes more sense to me than trying to ask your fans to travel to a bowl game, then a bowl game, then a bowl game. You're talking about doing, you know, because you got you're going to the, the the quarterfinals and then the semifinals and then the finals. And so um I, I would much rather see them have the second round of games also be held on campus. I think that would be better for that. By the way, Mattress Mac, you might remember that name. He won uh, about $75 million this year when the Astros won the World Series. He put up about $9 million in in bets on the Astros won the World Series. Uh, And according to Darren Ravel, um, he has now $3 million placed on TCU against Georgia in a variety of ways, some with the money line, some with the points. But if TCU pulls it off, uh, he could win almost $9 million on this as well. Uh, Mattress Mac, uh, businessman down in Texas, loves betting on Texas you know, sports and Texas, um, uh, Texas teams. So Mattress Mac could make another $9 million um, when, if TCU would somehow beat Georgia when that game is played on January 9th. Other news from college football. Jim Harbaugh reportedly has met with Carolina Panthers, with Carolina Panthers about their head coaching job. Now, it was being reported not as an interview, just a conversation. But what what the hell do you have a conversation with Carolina for uh, unless it was about the coaching job? So 
Uh, Jim Harbaugh's had back-to-back incredible years at Michigan after struggling for much of the first part of his tenure there, but they have lost all their bowl games. What, six bowl games thinking of Jim Harbaugh. So they're not doing well in bowl games. They've lost the last two years in the CFP. And will Jim Harbaugh, last year he wanted the Minnesota Vikings head coaching job. They didn't want him, so he went back to Michigan and said, I wanted to be here all along. This is where I want to be. NFL, I'm closing that book. I don't think he is. I think Jim Harbaugh, if he gets offered a job in the NFL, will leave Michigan. Uh, he's there. Arizona's out there, possibly. Indianapolis, for sure. And I think they'd love to have Harbaugh. Denver with Russell Wilson. Uh, Houston Texans, maybe with Lovey Smith and the number one pick potentially in the draft. If they don't have the number one pick, they'll, prob- they'll have the choice of the top quarterback because the Bears won't take a quarterback if they get the number one spot. And then uh, Carolina, the other option as far as a head coaching job. I, I expect Indy to make a big push for Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh is almost 60 years old. So if he's going to make the jump, it seems like the window probably is about to close on that if he wants to jump to the NFL. I don't see many teams making a jump, making a leap for like a 65-year-old Jim Harbaugh. And quite possibly, he may have taken Michigan as far as they can go. They've been great the last two years, no doubt about it. Huge kudos to Jim Harbaugh for that. But I'm not sure, you know, USC is coming into the conference. Um, I, I'm not sure if Michigan will ever get to that national championship level. They certainly get to the semifinals, and they uh, they had a very good chance of being TCU till the end there. But I'm not sure how much better. Obviously, they can't get much better than they are right now. And Harbaugh might want to go back to the NFL. College football is turning more into the NFL, and it just with more with more headaches, to be honest, because – You've got the NIL stuff, plus you're dealing with, you know, recruiting high school kids and then coaching 18, 19, 20-year-old kids who might make more money than the coach in some cases. And if you're going to to deal with, if you're going to do NFL-type program, why not do it in the NFL where you've got adults, you've got grown men that you're coaching, and maybe you have more say as far as in the way um, you know, the, the roster is constructed. I guess you would you'd have probably just more at the college level. But at the NFL level, though, if um, you also, it's easier, it's easier to compete for a championship in the NFL because of the parity in college football, Michigan especially. It's not, I mean, Michigan, will they ever compete with Alabama on a regular basis? Georgia, Ohio State, USC? Um, I don't know about that. So I could see Harbaugh making the jump to the NFL. I could see other coaches doing that as well as we get deeper and deeper into this NIL um, conundrum when it comes to players being recruited. With the transfer portal being what it is, you can recruit your ass off to get this kid. He can say, I'm going to your school, flip on signing day like a lot of kids did, or play there for a year and then leave and go somewhere else. Somebody who invests a lot of time, effort, and even money into to recruit somebody and have that happen. So I don't think Harbaugh would be the only one to consider this. Um, I, I don't think Saban would go back for it. I don't think Dabo is an NFL type coach. Uh, I could see Ryan Day for Ohio State at some point doing it if things keep happening the way they are happening with the NIL and with the way players are transferring. I don't think it's slowing down at all. But that's somebody who could eventually say, you know what? I, I, I'd just rather just go to the NFL. I, if I'm going to do this kind of stuff I'm doing, I'd rather just go do it at the NFL level and deal with more adults than recruiting and chasing around kids all across the country and worrying about them leaving after one year. Will Sean Payton get back in the mix? Sean Payton is reportedly putting together a staff uh, that he would use if he, if the right situation came up for him to be a head coach somewhere. I mentioned those jobs that I think will be open. Arizona, Indianapolis, Denver, Houston, Carolina, I think will all be looking for head coaches. Before the season, it looked like the Chargers were an option. And if I was Sean Payton, the Chargers would be an attractive option for me because they've got a great offense in place already with Justin Herbert. You've got Mike Williams there. Um, You've got um, Austin Eckler there. You've got a good defense. We have Bosa there. Uh, You've got a lot of talent on the defensive side of the ball as well. Now, the Chargers made the playoffs. That's probably me. That job will not open up uh, for Sean Payton, but that'd be the one I would go to. So now beyond that, you've got to look and decide, well, if I'm Sean Payton, or really anybody, Harbaugh, whoever I'm looking at to potentially take a job somewhere, I want to make sure it's a job where um, either I have a quarterback in place or I have the ability to get a quarterback that I want, meaning through the draft with a high draft pick. Also, 
How much control will I have? And what kind of owner, what kind of owner am I dealing with? Uh, Jim Ursay in Indianapolis, that's the biggest turnoff there. There's a lot of things I like about Indy. Um, you got a chance for to draft a quarterback this year with the way Indy's going. And they do have some skill there. You got Jonathan Taylor, who's really good. You got a couple of good backup running backs there as well um, that, that I think have a future with Indianapolis. So that one's attractive to me, also playing in the uh, winnable AFC South. Houston is also attractive because uh, although I do not think that they have the right quarterback in place there with Davis Mills, uh, they could draft a quarterback this year. And uh, if they have the number one pick, you have your choice there. Maybe that appeals to Sean Payton or Jim Harbaugh, whoever might be talking about taking the Houston job if they move on from Lovey Smith. Houston, for that reason, they're going to have two top, two high draft picks. You could draft your quarterback and receiver of the future and start getting at it right there. It's probably something that will be attractive to Sean Payton if he has the right amount of control with that team. They've got some picks, you know, they're getting from Cleveland, obviously, uh, through the Sean Watson deal. But uh, I like where Houston is a pop, probably the second best, maybe the best. Houston might be the best one of the bunch, just because I'm worried about Indy with the, the ownership there and how much they'll meddle. If you take Denver, you're, you're tied to you're tied to Russell Wilson, and you've got to believe in Russell Wilson because they're not getting rid of him. You're tied with into Russell Wilson for at least the next several years before they might feel get out of it uh, with taking on a lot of dead cap money. So that one, that one right there, Russell Wilson's the biggest detractor for me as to why I wouldn't like that job. The owners got a, a lot of money to spend and they want to win, but you're gonna have to do it with Russell Wilson. He took a big step back this year. Is it coaching? Maybe. But it could also just be that Russell Wilson now, he's you know been in the league 10 years. He might have peaked and is on the downward trend. So Denver, not as attractive to me. Arizona, you're tied to Kyler Murray. Do you want to be tied to Kyler Murray? I, I'm not convinced I would want to be. He's on the smaller side for me. And um, I, I just, I don't, the fact that all the drama that went through in the offseason about the contract extension, signing that, but he's got to study a certain amount of hours every week. That part turns me off as far as the culture in Arizona. Carolina, Carolina, uh, they've got some picks after trading Chris, Christian McCaffrey to the 49ers, but what's their, you know, what, how many skill players do they have that you really like? So Houston might be the best option for someone like Sean Payton. Uh, I could see Jim Harbaugh going back to Indy where he played quarterback. They love him there. Uh, Ursay loves him. I could see that happening. I think those two are probably the most attractive are Indy and Houston but probably Houston more attractive to me. Uh, and I do see, I, I could see another, another big name coach. Harbaugh's going to jump, I think, if it's offered the job, offered a job in the NFL. And I could see another big name coach also making that decision. The NCAA Division I Transformation Committee. Yes, that's a real thing. Transformation Committee. They are recommending more of each sport governing themselves. And they also want, in some sports, to have 25% of the teams eligible to compete for a championship. Now, that wouldn't apply to, like, football. But where it does apply is in basketball, where if you did that 25%, which they are recommending, I don't know if it's going to pass or not, if they'll go through, but they are recommending expanding the men's and women's tournaments to 90 teams each. 90 teams in the NCAA tournament. Now, at first... I thought that's insane. Why on earth would you need to go to 90 teams? But then I started thinking, I moved past to get off my lawn. That's not the way it was when I was growing up. What the hell? We don't need that many teams in it. When you look at it from another angle, it's just like, you know, it's it's not going to bother me if if 32 more or 22 more teams get into the tournament. That's not going to bother me. Let these other smaller schools, it gets some more smaller schools into the tournament and a chance to have their a uh, Hoosiers moment, a chance to have their miracle on ice moment, whatever you want to call it. I, it's not going to really change much as far as the, the rest of the tournament goes. I don't see a team that gets in as like the 84th team making a run to the final four. I don't think that's logical. You still might have a couple of nice upset Cinderella type stories here and there that you wouldn't have had before, but it's not like teams, you know, 69 through 90 are real legit contenders to win the NCAA tournament on the men's side. So I'm, you know, if they want to go to 90, makes the games on campus sites. I'm fine with that. You can do that. Just it, it'd be fun for some of those kids to say they played in the tournament, give them an opportunity then 
to get a couple more wins, a little more experience for the underclassmen going into next year, that type of thing. So I, I'm okay with it. The regular season in men's basketball is already pretty much irrelevant. It doesn't really matter much anymore. Um, it used to be, and again, get off my lawn, but you know, you only certain conferences only got a couple of teams in. It was a big deal. The Big Ten might only get two or three teams in. Now, like nine or ten Big Ten teams get in, makes it really less important in the regular season. So it's already not important. Going to ninety is not going to change that. It's it's not going to be any less important. It's just it's it's still pretty much irrelevant. They talk about these big time college basketball games. They mean very little. It really starts to pick up when you get to the conference tournaments and you got some teams that are trying to play their way into the field and then you get the NCAA tournament going. But, you know, big game in January, not really. Ohio State's playing Purdue, the number one ranked Purdue Boilermakers uh, coming up this week. Purdue just got beat by Rutgers, which is a big moment for Rutgers, yes. It, it's just a fly on the ass for Purdue. It doesn't really matter much. Purdue's still going to, you know, they've got plenty of time to work their way to be a top, uh, a, you know, like a, a top four team when the seeds come out again. They're going to be just fine. Uh, so where it does, and this is what I like about the women's side of the game, by the way, the women's basketball regular season, even though I like the same amount of teams in tournament as men, the women's regular season means so much more than the men's tournament does. And here's why. If you're a top four seed in a region, so the top 16 teams in the seeding in the women's side, you get to host the first two rounds at your home school, home at your home gym, home arena. So. That means the regular season is huge for them. You want to get to that. What an incredible advantage you have if you're playing your first two NCAA tournament games at home. No travel. Make teams come to you. You think any other women's basketball team is going to bring more fans than your team playing in the home arena? There's no way in hell. That's why it's so much more important on the women's side. The men will never do that, but if they did something like that, that would make the regular season more important. So I'm not that anti 90 team thing. I wish the regular season for the men's side meant more. And like I said, the women's side, it certainly means a lot more than for the men's tournaments. NBA performances lately have been amazing. Um, just listen to some of these numbers. I don't normally like to read stats, but Donovan Mitchell tonight had 71 points and 11 assists and went over Chicago. No one's ever scored that many points with double digit assists in NBA history. Recently, Luka Doncic had a 60 point, 21 rebound, 10 assist game. Joel Embiid, 59 points, 11 rebounds, 8 assists, and 7 blocks in a game. A couple of big games for Antonio Davis. Um, Anthony Davis, got Antonio Davis. That's a blast of the pass for the Pacers. In the, uh, who else did he play with? He played the, uh, the Knicks, I think it was also. But anyway, um, Anthony Davis, 55 points, 17 rebounds. Also, 37 points, 21 rebounds, 5 steals, and 5 blocks in a game. Uh, the Joker, Jokic out in Denver, 41, 15, and 15 and also 40, 27, and 10 assists. Giannis, 55 points, 10 rebounds, 7 assists. Devin Booker, 58 points a game. Klay Thompson at 54 the other night. All huge games in the NBA. And I don't know, remember seeing a stretch of games like this. There's certainly been some high-scoring games, yes, but not combined with this many rebounds, assists, and blocks in some cases. I mean, a 60-point triple-double by Luka, a 41-point triple-double and a 40-point triple-double with big 40 and 27 and 10 assists for the Joker. Amazing performances. And I wonder how close we are to our next 80-point game. Remember, Kobe at 81. Will somebody break that this year? With the way these guys are scoring, and not only that, just distributing the ball, but the way the NBA is opening up again as far as offense goes, I think we could see an 80-point game. There was a game the other night, I think it was, uh, I think Luke had 22 in the first quarter. So he was on pace to do it. But the NBA is a lot of fun to watch this year. Um, and that, the, the Donald Mitchell game, the seven points and 11 assists against Chicago, that was amazing watching that game. Uh, there's so much talent right now in the NBA, and it really has become a positionless league in a lot of ways. That's the way it's going to keep going, where you've got guys who can guard and play four or five positions. When you've got your center uh, getting 15 assists in a game, when you've got, um, uh, you know, a guard and Luka Doncic getting 21 rebounds in a game. Amazing performances by players in the NBA. All right, one final note here. The, um, the Dodgers have got to make a decision here pretty soon on Trevor Bauer. Trevor Bauer, if you remember, he was suspended 
uh, by Major League Baseball for 324 games for charges of sexual assault in a consensual sex situation, but um, the victim claimed that there were things that he did that she was not did not approve and things she did not know he was going to do or didn't know he did until after the fact. So he was suspended for 324 games without pay. Uh, arbitrator would reduce the suspension now to 194 games. So it is now over. The suspension is over. He will have played the first 50 games this year, I believe, without pay. But the Dodgers now have, they had two weeks they were given to either put Bauer back on the 40-man roster or cut it. So the Dodgers have got a couple options here. They can uh, add him back to the 40-man roster or they can release it. If they add him to the 40-man roster, um, then he's back on the team right now, and um, he'll be eligible to pitch right away. If they release him, if they decide we don't want any part of Trevor Bauer anymore, they still are roughly uh, res- responsible roughly for about uh, $22 million, according to CBS Sports, after he lost the first 50 games of pay. But they're still going to have to pay him the $22 million if they release him, no matter what. They, they keep pay him $22 million. If they release him, they're paying $22 million. So... Uh, but they had a two-week window in order to do that after the arbitrator released this decision that, that reduced the suspension and um, and put in place the, the fact he's going to be no pay for the first 50 games this year. So the Dodgers have until Friday to decide what they want to do, if they want to keep him, if they want to release him. I don't know. It, it's such a bad look PR-wise if they keep him. If they release and they're paying him, and then somebody else could sign him for the major league minimum, which um, is around seven hundred thousand dollars, someone could pay him that. Dodgers still on the hook for about the twenty-two million, like I talked about. I don't think the Dodgers will keep him. I think they will release him, and I think at first every team is going to say we don't want any part of Trevor Bauer. He's toxic, but if a contending team that's put a lot of money in their payroll and feels a lot of pressure to win and has a restless fan base and hasn't won for a long time. If they lose a key piece to their rotation, I think all of a sudden they'll have a switch in their morality. And I think it'll get picked up by somebody. I think Trevor Bauer does pitch somewhere in 2023. Might not be on opening day on a team. but I think at some point, Trevor Bauer gets back on a major league team. All right, that's it for me. Thanks so much for tuning in today to the Jeff Fidoff Show. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll have more coming up for you tomorrow. Uh, but um, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Fit Happens. This has been the Jeff Fitoff Show, Fan Stream Sports, powered by DSP Media.